Horatio Alger's effort was to popularize, and it was modeled on Samuel Smiles, who was a writer in Britain. And both of them were trying in the mid-19th century to say, here are, in very simple, very easy to read books, here are the habits that work. Here is the way to succeed. Here is how you should live your life if you want to get ahead. In a very real sense, the key to this is to understand that Horatio Alger is about you. That the goal here is to say to every American, you, you should be an entrepreneur. If you're not an entrepreneur, why not? You have all the freedom to be an entrepreneur. You have all the opportunity to be an entrepreneur. Remember, that means to undertake. It doesn't mean you have to go out and start a small business. It means you get up in the morning with an attitude that says, gee, I wonder what I'll undertake today. I wonder what I'll do today. Not how I'll suffer, not how I'll be victimized, not how I'll feel sorry for myself. What will I do? And that, and that reminds me. Uh, you were asked last week to, try, to turn in reports of being uh, people who are your personal hero or heroine. Because there's so much this is an attitudinal thing. Here are just a couple. I'm not going to give you the names. But here, various folks. A quote, I've been influenced by a large number of very special people. My father, a teacher, my commanding officer in the service, uh, people from history. But my greatest hero is my wife. She had polio as a child, was told she would not live past age 14, spent a total of three years in a body cast as a result of five back operations, lost her first husband in an accident at age 30, and was left with three children and a bankrupt business. Yet through faith and hard work, she has persevered and succeeded and is an inspiration to everyone she meets. Now in the 19th century, she would be the subject of a Horatio Alger type book. In the 20th century, of course, since she's succeeding, she could not make it on Donahue. Whereas if she would refuse to do anything, stay at home, and explain that she'd been victimized by bad luck, she could be on at least three talk shows. Okay. Um, second example. My heroine is my paternal grandmother who mothered me in many ways. She struggled with her husband in a dry cleaning business, struggled with alcoholism, had one child at age 36. She probably overattended to the family business and underattended her child, a child who would ignore her for the rest of her life. Her husband died in 1966, and she com lived completely alone and little love for 20 more years. She could have chosen to be bitter. She could have chosen to isolate herself from her son and grandchildren. Instead, she was always welcoming, nurturing, and loving her grandchildren, and never had a disparaging word for anyone in her family. She was my heroine, and her gifts in the midst of apparent emptiness uh, are a shining example. Uh, third example. My grandmother is my example of a heroine. She survived four husbands, with two dying of heart attacks and watching one die of cancer. Through all this, she managed to raise three children, all of whom are successful leaders in the community today. She also had a full-time job and worked another job to keep her family above poverty. She's been a leader in her church for the past 30 years. She has survived two heart attacks and still continues to be a community leader as well as a church leader today. She inspires me through her continued strength and perseverance. Now again, imagine every one of those excuses to say, well, I've had it. Time to quit. Lastly, while I was in the military, I had an instructor that was a Vietnam veteran. He'd been an air crewman on medevac helicopters and lost both of his legs while saving the lives of two Marines. He overcame his disabilities to teach others his knowledge of rescue, obviously saving many more lives. So I just want to give you a flavor that when we talk about courage, perseverance, strength, that this applies to every person. When we talk about being an entrepreneur, we're talking about every person. If you didn't get up this morning thinking, it's great to be an American, I'm a free person, time to go do something, then the problem's in you, it's not in the country. Now in that framework, there are three big concepts. First, the entrepreneur is a creative inventor. By that I mean that when you encounter a problem, the trick for the entrepreneur is to invent the solution. Uh, again, I mean, so over and over, when an entrepreneur runs into a problem, they try to think through what would solve this, rather than look at me, I can't get it done. And, they're ver and as a general rule, entrepreneurs have a lot of common sense, and, and they are very creative at problem solving. And the more they practice being an entrepreneur, the more creative they are. Second, it is the customer or the market or the goal which defines success. That is, tell you, you have to decide, what is it you're trying to please? How do you keep score? And, and I'm not asking you to have it to keep, I think every American should keep score separately. You ought to keep your score. But when you do, it is this thing outside you. It's the customer, or the marketplace, or the goal. That's what defines for you what your success is, not inside you. So as an entrepreneur, I'm not talking here about your values. Your values should be internal to you. I'm talking about 
how you focus your energy and your effort. It ought to be outside yourself, which you'll see also in Drucker's The Effective Executive is a major point. The great leaders are focused outside. What are you trying to accomplish? Now, the third is to recognize that getting the job done is the focus. And again, the, the credentialing really tears us apart because credentialing says getting the right piece of paper is the focus. That's why modern education is collapsing. Because we have too many people who know how to get papers and too few who know how to learn. And you get, so bureauc that's why bureaucracies collapse. Bureaucracies say, hey, we did all the processes, why are you mad at us? The fact that nothing got achieved is not our fault. We had every meeting, we stamped every paper, we reviewed every document. You shouldn't be mad at us. But an entrepreneur knows that it's getting the job done. So you define the job, you make sure the job fits your goal, your market, or your customer, and then you get the job done. And you do what it takes, ethically and legally, to get the job done. Now, this, this comes into a fascinating thing which, which Jeff Eisenach and others have really opened me up to in, in, in the whole concept of uh, how do we define getting to success. And I want to share with you what I think is, is truly, if you'll, if you'll focus on it, a remarkable insight. There are two visions of success that grew up in the 20th century. Character building versus popularity seeking. That from Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac and, and the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin up through Napoleon Hill's uh, Law of Success, which is a great old book that I really recommend to you to, just, to at least check out the library and take a look at. The Law of Success by, by Napoleon Hill is, uh, he went around and interviewed uh, Andrew Carnegie and Henry Ford and Thomas Edison and a generation of successful people and he said, what works? And he wrote down what works. And if you read this, I mean I'd say this to any American, if you spend some time and read this, for example, The Law of Success, Lesson 8, Self-Control. And he walks through why self-control matters. You'd find that he focuses consistently on building character, on what it is that we need to do. And you can read Drucker's The Effective Executive, which I'll come back to. You can read Grinding It Out by Ray Kroc. These are, when people say, how can I be successful? Go to a used bookstore and get a copy of Grinding It Out by Ray Kroc, or go to the library and check it out for free. That's, you know, don't tell me you're too poor to learn. It's a great book. He found in McDonald's. It's a study of perseverance. And his story of getting permission to build a McDonald's in Chicago, but only according to the specifications of the original McDonald's Brothers building in California, which was in Bakersfield near the desert, getting to Chicago and realizing they had no basement for a, for a furnace, and spending a year getting them to rewrite the document so he could build a furnace in a basement is hysterical. Or his discovery that this, one of the secrets of McDonald's is his french fries. Anyone know why their french fries are different? What do you mean by Blanche? They're slightly cooked. Uh, and I guess to seal in the, the moisture. No. Okay. They're aged. They're aged. Oh, okay. That's very important. He discovered he couldn't get the french fries right in Chicago. He went back out to the desert. He's, again, he's following the problem to get the knowledge. He goes back out to the desert and he says, what do you do? They say, well, when we buy the potatoes, we put them out back in the shed. Turns out they were dehydrating 8 to 10 percent of their body weight. The french fries from McDonald's are slightly dehydrated. That's why they're crisper. But he had to work his way back historically to figure out what they had done. It's a, it's a great book. 